This is indeed a, a unique day in the United States. This program is not about Iraq nor impeachment, although the general would be fascinating on the question of Iraq. You all know that he, he led the uh, uh, famous left hook. I don't know what that has to do with a Hail Mary pass, but it, in any case, the famous left hook was under his command in 1991. We're reminded, uh, I think, by the confluence of events um, of the en enormity and complexity of anyone's interest in public affairs uh, and the importance of keeping one's perspective. And certainly while a, a variety, a whole web of questions are being raised about the topics of the day, there is probably very few issues, if any, which are as profoundly related to the national interest of the United States as the ongoing and omnipresent problem of drugs in the United States. And this topic is uh, unfortunately nearly permanent for us, and it's profoundly important, and one of the many vital interests of the nation to which one has to pay attention regardless of circumstances. Let me... Uh, thank three friends of the council for supporting this afternoon's program. The Greater Baltimore Committee, first of all, uh, Don Hutchinson, who is here, is the president of the GBC, uh, has served on the, the board of trustees of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs, and we're grateful to him. Secondly, the First National Bank of Maryland, a longtime friend of the council, and uh, and thirdly, the Philip and Sophia Macht Foundation for a decade, a nice supporter of the council and uh, especially its programs on education. And I remind you that our next program in January will be the 19th annual Baltimore Sun Foreign Policy Panel, uh, which is uh, always, always popular. And we're delighted that Joe Stern is with us today, Joe, who chaired that panel for 18 years. I'd also like to thank um, for the TV rebroadcast of this program, and our programs go to about 800,000 households potentially across the state of Maryland, uh, uh, the Northrop Grumman Corporation and Lloyd Carpenter. Lloyd is the chairman of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs and the vice president for international operations for Northrop Grumman. Introducing our, let me ask you to thank those people for us. Introducing uh, the general today is a, a gentleman who has graced uh, the Board of Trustees of the Council, uh, the Mayor of Baltimore, uh, as you all know, a product of the Baltimore Public Schools, Yale University, Oxford is a Rhodes Scholar, Harvard Law School, it came back to Baltimore with Piper Marbury, was an Assistant, Secret uh, Assistant State's Attorney, and then State's Attorney, Mayor of Baltimore since 1987, completing now his third term. Uh, his administration is rightfully proud of its uh, initiatives in, in uh, literacy, education, housing, health, uh, city revitalization, and economic development. And as you all know, he's had a long-standing, earnest, and imaginative approach to drug policies, uh, favoring viewing it as uh, a public health problem as opposed to emphasizing uh, law enforcement. It's uh, an enormous pleasure to present uh, the mayor of Baltimore, Kurt Schmoke. Well, thank you very much, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, a real pleasure uh, to be here and to be able to uh, introduce one of the uh, country's uh, most distinguished public servants and, and a uh, person that I uh, view as uh, one of the uh, uh, federal government's uh, greatest listeners. Uh, is a man uh, with the enormous uh, capacity uh, to not only in terms of his actions, but also to be able to synthesize the views of uh, competing individuals and, and complex problems and come out with uh, real solutions to some of the toughest problems uh, that we face. As you know, uh, General McCaffrey has been the uh, director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy since uh, February of 1996. He 
serves as a member of the President's Cabinet and also in the National Security Council for uh, drug-related issues. Uh, General McCaffrey, as you know, uh, recognizes that these problems that we face uh, with respect to uh, drug policy not only impact uh, domestic policy, but of course uh, foreign policy uh, concerns with the movement of uh, money related to uh, trafficking in drugs, uh, with the uh, impact on foreign nations, uh, with the uh, also uh, the currency that's become so disruptive to other economies, it is important to have someone with this world view. He is a graduate of Phillips Academy uh, at Andover and the U.S. Military Academy. He holds a Master's of Arts degree in civil government and taught at uh, American University from which he received his master's and also attended uh, Harvard uh, University. His uh, distinguished uh, record in the military has uh, uh, been explained, including uh, three tours overseas in Dominican Republic and Vietnam and Iraq. And uh, he has uh, been uh, uh, he's a recipient of the Dis Distinguished Service Cross. Uh, General McCaffrey also uh, has been married uh, for 34 years and uh, has uh, three children, uh, very much involved in serving uh, the public. Uh, Congressman Cummings uh, wanted me to express um, his regards. He is tied up in Washington and hopes to see you uh, later at the uh, uh, Police Athletic Center. But I'm so pleased that uh, General McCaffrey is here. He's been a good friend to uh, Baltimore, helping us as uh, we work on a combined strategy of addressing uh, our problem, as both through law enforcement and in public health. And as I said, one of the most progressive and distinguished public servants on the national scene. It's my pleasure to introduce General Barry McCaffrey. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, for that very generous introduction. And we have indeed uh, had a continuing dialogue with the uh, leadership, with the mayor personally. I have learned a lot from, uh, from his own views, uh, from listening to his own attempts to uh, confront the enormous suffering that drug abuse and its consequences bring uh, to this city as well as across the country. And I thank him for that. And uh, another uh, great partner has been Elijah Cummings. Uh, this fella has tremendous integrity, uh, common sense, and has been an active partner in Congress in trying to get the resources rounded up uh, to establish a long-term sensible uh, U.S. drug policy. And I'm a great admirer of him personally. And this morning, earlier, we were over at the uh, Turk House, a drug treatment facility of which Baltimore should be enormously proud. And Senator Paul Sarbanes was there with me at that. So I, you know, I've gotten a lot of help. There are indeed uh, a, a decent number of people in both houses of Congress uh, who have spent a good bit of their adult li life thinking through this uh, challenge. And they know what they're talking about, and they're willing to, to uh, to support us. I'm sorry Kathleen Kennedy Townsend isn't here. Uh, she's been, I think, a national model on this issue. We've been very proud of her own organizational ability and the kind of programs that uh, are going on in this state. Uh, we'll be in public with her in probably January or February. Uh, we're going to try and get the president involved as we talk about building drug-free prisons. And this state's done a pretty decent job, along with Delaware, at trying to uh, talk through that challenge. A uh, bunch of other folks in the room have been a big help to me. I couldn't recognize all of you. Let me mention Tom Carr, the director of the Baltimore, Washington, Haida, high intensity drug trafficking area. It's one of 21 around the country. Uh, it's not a lot of money. It's a $186 million program uh, this year uh, to sustain local, state, federal, law enforcement, and prosecution seeing drug abuse as a system challenge. And uh, one of the most effective ones in the country is here in Baltimore. And Tom Carr has done a tremendous bit uh, for that, uh, uh, that operation. Johnny Hughes is here, past president of the National Troopers Coalition, been a uh, very faithful and, uh, and energetic uh, in national leadership on this drug issue. And I thank him for his help. Uh, Bill Kaltreider, president of the Center for Alcohol and Drug Research and Education. Uh, has been very influential in the private sector, and I thank him for his involvement. Dr. Jill Johns, uh, I am an unpaid shill for her book, Go Get It and Read It. 
she's a Johns Hopkins historian, uh, put together an excellent piece of work, Hepcats, Narcs, and Pipe Dreams. And uh, it really tries to get the history of drug abuse in America, and if, I, if she would allow me to say it, uh, to give it some life, to, to teach the story of drug abuse in America from an anecdotal viewpoint. And I found it uh, very, uh, very useful to try and see the context of today's problems, the same human body, the same drug, and what happens when uh, two of them interact. Uh, Dr. Bill Bird, thanks very much for the possibility to appear in front of this group and talk to you very briefly, and more importantly, to listen to your own comments and try and respond to your own questions. Uh, you are, in theory, uh, interested in the foreign policy aspects of the drug problem, and I'd be glad to address that. Uh, it's an important component. Uh, you know, I tell people I've spent 14 years of my public service outside the United States. I grew up in NATO. Uh, I am an unabashed supporter of the United Nations and worked very actively with Dr. Pinar Laki, the United Nations Drug Control Program. Uh, we have an active, ongoing partnership with the Organization of American States, uh, not just Secretary General Gaviria, but also the CCOD Commission, which is now building a 34-nation cooperative uh, effort to confront the drug problem in the hemisphere. And our challenge is before the summit of the Americas in Canada in the year 2000, that we will actually have an ongoing multinational sense of, of cooperation. And we won't see it just as intelligence sharing and interdiction, but also as the, uh, the pooling of resources and knowledge uh, and demand reduction. Uh, I would also suggest to you that uh, there's, it's quite clear to me that, uh, that uh, if you look at our national drug strategy, uh, that an important component uh, of this strategy has to be cooperation in the international community. I don't believe, personally, that we'll get at the problems of drug addiction in Baltimore or in Maryland or in the United States by focusing on the production of heroin. You know, and there's an easy one. Normally, when you listen to Americans about drug abuse, they're talking about one of the big devastating drugs, heroin or cocaine. Uh, heroin makes a great teaching example. Uh, you know, who knows? Our, our numbers are so soft in this field, it's astonishing. If we were talking agricultural policy or international economic policy or national security policy, usually the numbers are agreed among educated people. What we argue over are hypotheses or policy options. In the drug area, nobody agrees in the numbers. Now, I got some good numbers. After three years of listening to experts like the National Institute of Drug Abuse, we've got some pretty decent numbers on drug abuse in America. Let me give you a number, just to per perhaps promote uh, dialogue in the, in the Q&A period. If you talk about heroin, most of us don't use heroin. There's 270 million of us. Uh, how many do you use? I don't know. The number I'll tell you today is 810,000 of us are compulsively using heroin today. I used to carry a figure of 295,000. Uh, then it went up maybe to a half million. Now I'm using 810,000. That may undercount it, uh, but it's still a pretty good figure. That 810,000 uh, group of heroin addicts <clears throat> possibly, and here's, here I'm into a non-number that would have Dr. Peter Reuter at uh, University of Maryland fall down on the floor in a dead faint, but probably for discussion purposes, our heroin addicts are using 13 metric tons of heroin a year. There's a ballpark figure. It's enough to have heuristic value to you and I, 13 metric tons of heroin. Now, when it comes to the production of drugs like coca or opium, we got pretty good figures because we have a tool. We love technology. We have a tool, overhead satellite systems, that we used against the Soviets for 40 years to watch grain production, to watch their transportation system. 
though we do watch the production of coca and opium, probably in the global community we produce 400 metric tons of heroin a year. And we use 13 metric tons. Now, here's the challenge. <clears throat> the rates of uh, heroin abuse in our country, well under 1%, are much lower than Pakistan. There, you know, maybe there are 3 million heroin addicts in Pakistan. Hey, you can buy it. Heroin isn't really worth anything. The supply so grossly exceeds the demand. The product has so little value added. Uh, the production costs are so low. The requirements for skilled labor almost non-existent that you can buy heroin for four to six dollars a day and use it as a Pakistani truck driver and get addicted. And I might add, same thing goes for cocaine. You know, cocaine, again, who knows, probably there are 3.6 million of us who are chronically addicted to cocaine. I shouldn't really say it that way because there almost is no such thing as a cocaine addict or a heroin addict. It's poly drug abuse. It's alcohol stupid, the most dangerous drug in America, combined with other drugs. But if you look at cocaine, let's say there's 3.6 million of us using cocaine. How much do we use? I don't know. The figure I would offer to you is under 300 metric tons. Probably 260 metric tons is a good way to understand it. The world produced last year 700 metric tons of cocaine. And that drug, our dr uh, cocaine use is going down rapidly. No question about it. If you look back over the last decade, we've gone from 6 million Americans down to 1.7 million who casually use cocaine. But the difference, the problem for you and I, for the mayor, uh, for, uh, for Janet Reno, for Donna Shalala, for Dick Riley, those of us who are really at the heart and soul of the drug strategy, the problem is that uh, essentially these products can be sold for almost nothing. And so trying to control addiction rates by limiting supply, by driving up the price, is a very tough proposition. It's worth trying. It's never appropriate to give up on the interdiction effort. We can do a lot better than we are, and we're going to in the southwest border. Uh, we, we have to work with the international community for reasons that are unrelated to the drug problem here in Baltimore. We've got to make sure that Bolivia doesn't turn into a narco-democracy. We've got to make sure that uh, raw international crime doesn't triumph over democracy. Uh, but again, it's the weak lever to use to address the problem of drug abuse in America. Now, what are we doing? What's the deal? Uh, first of all, we've got to recognize what the problem is. You know, the, <clears throat> uh, the first uh, notion is, what is our purpose? Who suffers from drug abuse? So what's the big deal? Isn't it somebody else's problem? Isn't it a minority problem, a city problem, a poor person's problem, uh, a problem of those who are emotionally ill? It doesn't really affect my employees, does it, my family, my friends. Are there consequences for me? That's one of the areas I think you and I have to help hold up a mirror to America. We've got to do that. We've got to understand, as we look at drug abuse in America, the first assertion we make is most of us aren't using drugs. It's abnormal behavior. It's not accepted socially or in accordance with the law and most of us aren't doing it. There's 270 million of us. 70 million have tried an illegal drug. So how old you were when you were in your adolescent through college years depends on, describes the statistical probability of you having been exposed to drug use. You know, I graduated from uh, college level schooling in 64, high school in 60. There were no drugs in America. Now, maybe there was a, you know, a 
jazz musician in New Orleans using it, or, but I didn't know anybody using drugs. By 1968, that was no longer the case. Now, who's using drugs today? Seven out of 10 are employed. They got jobs. They're employed. If you look at lifetime rates of exposure to drugs in America, it goes white, black, Hispanic. If you look at actual drug use rates and can we find a positive correlation on socioeconomic status, maybe you can, but I don't really believe that. But if I made the argument, then I would argue that if you look at demographic control factors on drug use, the lowest drug use rates in our country, hands down, unarguably, are active duty members of the armed forces, for starters. It's essentially a drug-free institution. Positive test rates for drug, well under 1%. Interesting, because during the 70s, the armed forces were almost destroyed as an effective professional institution by drug abuse. You get down to 1% use rates in the active armed forces or below. The next category up are African Americans under the age of 30 who use less cigarettes, alcohol, cocaine, marijuana, and heroin than whites do in the same uh, categorization. And indeed, if you go to crack cocaine, a classic black drug of the central city, the per capita crack cocaine use rates are twice as high among whites as among blacks. Now, I don't make that assertion because I believe there is a racial component to drug abuse. But I do make the assertion to stimulate our recognition that if you want to worry about drugs, you better worry about your own children and your own employees and your own associates, because that's where the drug abuse problem is. What are the consequences of it? They're devastating. <clears throat> Six percent of the country used an illegal drug last month. That's the deal. Uh, better than in 1979, because then 14 percent of the country would have used an Ill illegal drug last month. It's gone way down. It's gotten better. You should expect today the NYPD to be mostly drug free. Most of the big corporations, that certainly the, uh, the Fortune 500 companies, have EAPs. And so you march up to the door and you find out that mother can't work there unless she's willing to take a drug test on entrance and pledge to a drug-free uh, employment history. Things have gotten a lot better. But there are still 13 million of us who are regularly using illegal drugs. And the impact on society is simply unbelievable. What's the most dangerous drug in America? Many of us would argue, and I think this is a very sensible argument to make, that uh, the challenge that, that most seriously jeopardizes our future, you and I, is best uh, described by some of the work done at Columbia University, uh, Dr. Joe uh, Herb Kleber and Joe Califano's associates, and it's called gateway behavior. It's the general idea that children in America, and there's a bunch of them, a bunch of them, there's 38 million school kids out there. It's bigger than the population of most of the nations on the face of the earth. 38 million school kids. They leave the sixth grade, and they're not using drugs. They've seen them. They know about them. Fifth and sixth graders, you ask them, do you know what marijuana is? Do you know about needles? You ask a kid in Baltimore. They will understand about drugs. The D.A.R.E. program, thank God for the D.A.R.E. program, and other useful drug prevention efforts. But then they get into middle school, and three things happen. They start smoking cigarettes, abusing alcohol, and smoking marijuana. And so I would argue, if you look at a 12-year-old who's smoking pot on weekends, you're looking at somebody who may be in a statistical probability that is 79 times greater of having a compulsive drug use problem when he grows up than one who isn't. That's the deal. If you can get through until about age 19 and minimize 
or delay the onset of drug using behavior, then your chance of having a problem go way down. How do you do that? Is it an impossible task? No. NIDA publishes an excellent a little document that has prevention guidelines in there. Columbia University's done some great studies. Is Dr. Hoover Adger here? I didn't mention his name. He's ill. He's Ill. Um, Johns Hopkins has done some great work. UCLA, uh, University of Michigan, uh, University of Maryland's done some first-rate work. We do understand how you end up as populations of young people who are less likely to end up in drugs. Columbia University has 73 risk correlation factors. These are not breakthroughs in Western intellectual thought. Number one, if you're eating supper with your parents five nights a week, you're not using drugs. If you go to church or synagogue on the weekends, you're not using drugs. If you're in the sports program, organized sports, like the police athletic lead, the mayor and I will go uh, see this afternoon, you're not using drugs. The boys and girls clubs, if you are in a dysfunctional family, if you're in a single parent family, if you're in a dual income family that's dysfunctional, and believe you me, that's the case, uh, can be the case, and you've still got access to the YMCA, the Boys and Girls Club, a mentoring program, you can put children at a reduced risk of ending up with drug using behavior. And that includes, I would argue, cigarettes and alcohol. We should have a no drug use policy for illegal drugs, which include cigarettes and alcohol, for adolescent Americans. Um, that's what we're working on. That's what the national drug strategy argues for. And if you would, and we've got your little packet there, you can go to my idea at age 56 of a centerfold, and this is it. These are the five goals, the 32 objectives of the national drug strategy. And we say you don't get to pick and choose from the menu. You actually have to do all of them in some coherent and long-term way. The metaphor of the war on drugs, which many continue to use as a way to critically attack current U.S. policy, we're saying this isn't a war on drugs. It's the metaphor that's more appropriate is a cancer affecting American society. And so it's based on a clearly a prevention strategy. It's targeted on adolescents. That's goal number one in its objectives. And then if you look at goals two and three, they clearly relate to managing this small number of us, four million or so, who are chronically addicted to drugs, how do you get effective treatment and glue it back into the uh, criminal justice system in particular? You know, you've got to do something. Go ask a serious cop about drugs in America. There's three people to ask, a serious law enforcement guy, a hospital emergency room physician, or somebody involved in the drug treatment community like these beautiful human beings at the Turk House. I, you're dealing with somebody, you know, it's not a matter of discipline or morality. It's a person who has changed brain function. And now Dr. Alan Leshner and others, we actually have a machine, which we all have reverence for, that will take a picture of glucose metabolic activity using PET scan techniques, and you can watch the human brain on cocaine. And you can see it's a, it's a clearly, it's changed neurochemistry. And the person has irrational behavior, and they know it, and they're not happy about it. A lot of people that are happy being criminals, but nobody is happy being addicted. It's a life of abject misery. And so we're going to organize, Donna Shalala and I, and Togo West, and the others of us, to get adequate funds to create the treatment capacity we need, particularly for those that are involved in the criminal justice system. That's where you end up. For sure, if you're a chronic addict, you'll end up in the criminal justice system. We got 1.8 million of us behind bars today. Can you imagine that? We have more people behind bars than we got in the active armed forces. We probably have the highest per capita incarceration face, uh, rate on the face of the earth. 
it'll probably go up another 20% in the next five years if we don't do something about it. We can do something about it. We absolutely, we brought together the country's experts last March, Donna Shalala and Janet Reno and I, and we listened to them, and we published their, their papers, and prior to the spring rolling around, we'll try and bring together the state legislators of America and the drug treatment professionals and the senior law enforcement officials, and we'll talk about hooking treatment to the criminal justice system. <coughs> And I, I think it's going to be, uh, the, look, the good news is, Madam Taxpayer, it's a lot cheaper way to run the country's social policy on drug abuse. So we're going to move on that. And then finally, and let me, if I may, close out here. Uh, none of this is to suggest that there isn't an important international component. So if you look at goals four and five, back to the Council on Foreign Affairs, uh, people who are interested in that international community, there is a very um, important component. We don't put a lot of money there. 3.6% of our federal dollars go to some international component. About 10% go to an interdiction function. And we get a lot of work to do. We can do this a lot more sensible. We can do for the southwest border 39 ports of entry, the biggest open border on the face of the earth. 260 million people cross the border every year, if you can imagine. There's nothing like it, not Germany and Belgium. You know, there's 82 million cars and trucks a year go across that border, a half million rail cars. It's growing year after year. There's 100 million Mexicans down there. They're our second biggest trading partner. We're not going to militarize that border. We're not going to put up anti-tank berms. We're going to encourage cross-border political, cultural, and economic cooperation. But we're also going to try and get law and order established. There's no border down there. Most of it's barely marked. We can use technology and intelligence. We can do for the border what we did for air travel. Right now, you, you know, several hundred thousand Americans every day get on a plane you surrender some right to free movement, some openness to, to non-intrusive inspection technology, and in return you get promised a high likelihood, no bomb, no gun, no trouble on the flight. We'll do the same thing at the border over the coming five to 15 years. Technology's there. This is not dream world stuff. You know, we invented machines for uh, the START treaty. Uh, actually, it was SALT too, to look through Soviet ICBM shipping containers inside Russia for treaty verification. We can look through a rail car, look through an 18-wheeler, and see two kilograms of cocaine welded inside the truck. You cannot have the National Guard, and there's 4,000 of them out there right now. I have a minor bias on the National Guard. My baby girl's a captain in the National Guard. <laughs> you cannot ask the National Guard to unload 18-wheeler trucks of frozen tuna and then drill holes in the truck wall and find heroin and cocaine. That's silly. It won't work. But we can use technology and intelligence. We can largely change the uh, smuggling pattern. And finally, you've got to work with your international neighbors. You know, many of you in this room have had a lot of experience with NATO, uh, as I have. You know, you grow up learning you're one of 16, whether it's a Danish Navy uh, lieutenant commander or an American Air Force brigadier general. You all got to reach consensus or you can't get anything to happen. We do understand how to build multinational cooperation. Publicly praising people when they serve international legal interests privately demanding better behavior, uh, that's what we got to do. And we're, we're working on that. Like for the, the Mexicans, an astonishing change in the relationship between these two countries. And it's not easy, but that's the direction we've elected to embark on. Now, I, uh, I would, uh, with your permission, uh, wrap up there and, and uh, tell you, uh, I think the biggest challenge we face, hands down, in the whole area of drug abuse is lack of confidence. You know, when I'd been in this job for about a year, uh, the vice president asked me what, you know, I thought I'd learn. I said, well, the most astonishing thing 
uh, was that Americans who believe we can do anything, you know, we can put a person on the moon in 10 years from the time we start, in, oh, by the way, we didn't declare war on the moon when we, when we did that. Uh, we can build the interstate highway system. We can put together the Gulf Coalition. We can beat um, uh, incredible uh, life-threatening illnesses. Uh, we can do anything. But when it comes to drug abuse, there's an astonishing lack of confidence. That, well, it's you know, too, too hard to do. It's the drug supply problems all in some foreign country. It's not. We're a drug supply country, methamphetamines, marijuana. Uh, and then the second notion is that uh, drug use uh, probably isn't my problem, it's somebody else's. Uh, one of my purposes has been to say, don't you kid yourself, it's your problem, and you can do something about it. On that note, uh, I very much thank you, Bill, for the opportunity to talk to this group, and I open myself to your questions. Thank you. <clears throat> And the floor is open, and I've been asked to repeat the question. So we're on uh, cable TV around, uh, around the state. Uh, normally, I plant the first questions, Mr. Mayor. Uh, things like, how, why are you guys so great? Stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the question is, uh, I would argue, the most important one that we can affect in the two short years we have left in office. And it basically gets the notion of, uh, how do you accept as a, uh, a legal, the question I'm about to repeat it, as a legal and social model that health care out of the health insurance industry will accept parity for substance abuse as well, I might add, as mental health. And right now, the only, the only caution I would have is the most useless, useless thing we can do is rail against the health industry for not voluntarily paying more money uh, to confront substance abuse. They won't do it unless the rules of the game are changed. They're not supposed to do it. They're supposed to try and minimize the outflow of money and maximize the inflow. Now, we've got, uh, so I rarely would, you know, want to deride the, an HMO for restrictive policies. What we've got to do, and there's some states are already moving on it. State of Washington's done some uh, superb exploratory work and others. If you go up in a level of analysis, and if you accept as correct that drug treatment saves incredible resources for society, you're going to pay for drug abuse one way or the other. You can pay for it in the emergency room. You can pay for it in traffic accidents. You can pay for it in the criminal justice system. I tell people it's $38 billion a year to lock up 1.8 million people. You're going to pay for it someplace. The cheapest thing to do, just from an ops research viewpoint, is effectively apply drug treatment and do it not when they're 31, HIV positive, unemployed for 10 years, hepatitis C, tuberculosis, leg sores, their family hasn't talked to them for a decade, They've been in and out of prison for nine years. There's one option. The other is start when they're 16 or 18 or 21. So we've been making the argument, say, look, right now, uh, if you look at an addicted teenager, that youngster is going to cost you, Mr. Taxpayer, two million bucks in their remaining lifetime. That's the expected lifetime hit of that adolescent. You can do something about it right now, but right now the only people who did effectively, except for scattered programs, I went up to Hazelton Institute uh, last month, you know, lots of people like to deride Hazelton. If my son or daughters were addicted as adolescents, they'd be in the Hazelton Institute at $14,000 for 28 days. Sat there in a room with about 30 youngsters, most beautiful kids you've ever seen. Um, and, you know, one uh, young man uh, out of Dallas, Texas, uh, all upper middle income families, obviously, uh, had a $3,500 a week drug habit. Now, how do you make that much money? You, prostitution's one possible angle, but mostly they're selling drugs. So they're, the epidemic of drug use spreads enormously rapidly among youngsters. We have to provide health care for substance abuse. 
There's a bill that got introduced in Congress last year, uh, Senator Wellstone and, God, uh, Senator Ram and Congressman Ramstad, um, and it basically is health care parity. Uh, we didn't have time to mull it over. The coming con session of Congress, that is the most important contribution I would argue we could make, is move that uh, bill through. And the preliminary analysis by Donna Shalala's people indicates uh, probably at max a 1% increase in, in uh, cost to the industry of doing it. I mean, it's a no-brainer. We ought to do this uh, from a societal viewpoint. And uh, I'll bet we can make those arguments in the coming two years. I think the other thing it'll do is bring it back into the mainstream. Right now, the, the $3 billion we've got into drug treatment prevention, the federal dollars, by and large are block grants to states and they show up uh, for those who don't have health insurance policies, who don't have a house that can be sold after repeated drug treatment uh, penalties. So I think we're going to move in the right direction. You are right on target. That is one of the essential missing links in the U.S. national drug policy. Um, yes, sir. Is there any evidence that uh, people who are forced into a drug treatment program can be cured? Well, you know, there's been a lot of discomfort uh, uh, about that notion. Uh, one of the, um, as a good entry officer, which is what I w certainly was, uh, my motto used to be frequently wrong but never in doubt. <laughs> and so I would offer you a categorical response to that question, which is, yes, there is clear evidence that coerced treatment works, and I do believe that. There's studies on both sides of the issue, but I, I don't think there's any question that, uh, that if you, uh, that we're watching this drug court phenomena. Three years ago, there were 12 of them. Now there are 400 of them. When we come out of office, I hope there are a thousand of them. And there's no magic to this. But it basically says if you're a busted, nonviolent, first-time offender, uh, however you set the rules, and you're clearly, clearly a compulsive drug user, and if you volunteer uh, for the program, uh, you'll end up uh, dealing with a judge, which may be the first authority figure in the last decade you've dealt with, who has both power and, uh, and love for you. And there we will insist that you go into drug treatment. And we'll give you a drug test every week, and we'll uh, get you bus tokens. We'll get you some glasses, because you're a human wreck when you end up in front of the drug court. And about a year later, and you'll have several relapses during the year, because this is a chronic relapsing disorder, cure, quotes, makes me very nervous. Uh, I prefer to talk about five-year survival rates, uh, et cetera. But the probability is at the end of a year in the drug court, you'll come back in, uh, you'll have pink glow in your cheeks, you'll have your two children with you, uh, we'll give you a big round of applause, uh, and you'll go back to, uh, to life. And if you stay then in NA and AA for the rest of your life and stay <coughs> scared, you might be drug three. I think probably a third of the people that go through that system a year or more later are drug free, and another third have substantially reduced their drug taking behavior. So I would suggest that coerced drug treatment uh, will end up being an essential component of dealing with the category of the drug population who are in the criminal justice system. Yes, ma'am. Um, this old hippie has a question that I feel that a lot of the problems that we have with treating drug abuse come from the fact that a lot of people go to the same place and then they get to meet each other. And I, I remember being a hippie, the big thing that kept us all using drugs was the solidarity and this social life that we had through it. So uh, I'm wondering why it is that we can't have druggies go to their individual physicians so that they don't meet other druggies when they're getting treatment. Well, um, I'm certainly sympathetic to your viewpoint. Um, uh, poorly run drug treatment programs can result unintentionally in creating 
law enforcement free enclaves around the treatment center where prostitution, drug trading, uh, simple crime occurs. There is some argument in some scientific studies for the, it's a very cruel world, the nut bowl effect uh, where if there is believed to be an, a part of a metropolitan area, Vancouver Springs to mind, uh, that uh, people emerge from isolated drug abuse where they had only sallied forth to find drugs and retreated to a hole under a bridge and they meet each other and they, uh, so there is some argument for nut bowl effect. Now having said all that, um, one of the things I've really uh, given me an enormous amount of joy in this job is going to drug treatment centers. I'll just be honest with you. Around the country, you know, the village in Miami or the Striver House in Harlem or, uh, you know, at the top end of the line, Betty Ford Center or Hazelden Institute or whatever, and to watch people, uh, those who are addicted, I mean, the sheer misery of their existence is beyond belief. And the, those who are miserable, by the way, you know, give t 10 Americans uh, five minutes and they'll be talking about downtown Baltimore uh, and it's a 31-year-old African-American. How about talking about the Talbot Marsh House in Atlanta, which is probably the preeminent drug treatment facility in the country for impaired physicians. And I might add they run another program for impaired airline pilots. And you go in there and you're sitting in a room with 25 docs <laughs> And, you know, that's a 45-year-old uh, white female San Francisco plastic surgeon, and she's addicted to Percocet and alcohol and cocaine, poly drug abuse, and uh, her life's in disarray, and she's in trouble with the law, and the DEA's got her registration, and her family hates her, and her body <coughs> is physically beat, and her neurochemical uh, function is changed. And we deal with her the same way you do an 18-year-old Hispanic boy in Los Angeles. Now, part of it is this therapeutic community model uh, is one of the greatest accidental discoveries, I would argue, we've had in this country in the last 50 years. Uh, so AA, NA, the 12-step program, suffering people helping each other, um, I would argue that's, that's powerful. In fact, I'm at the point now where I, and I don't, I'm not sure that the numbers have persuaded me so much as listening to people who have done this their entire life. If you are severely addicted to heroin, cocaine, alcohol, et cetera, and you don't stay in some therapeutic relationship through NA and AA, you will never construct a drug-free lifestyle. So I'd almost be at the opposite end of that, but I'm still aware of and have respect for your concerns. Badly run treatment programs or methadone maintenance clinics uh, can be a real disaster for a community, and we, but we've got sensible people that know how to avoid that. Uh, yes, sir, let me change sides of the room. Um, I actually cut ahead of the other gentleman, but thanks. I'm an emergency mm -hmm. physician. I work uh, in the inner city, and I have actually two questions, if I may. The first is, what role do you see practitioners playing when we see at the front line somebody who has actually abused alcohol, maybe gotten themselves into a medical problem or a serious traffic accident, or somebody who's abused drugs and was dumped on the front door of the emergency department by some of their buddies? And part two is that along with the treatment programs that you have um, described, I have seen and discussed a little bit another alternative which we might think of as kind of the 7-Eleven program which fairly heavily advertised in at least this local paper is a physician who has a, I think it's a 12 or 24 hour detox program and in a nutshell he puts them to sleep with Ativan, intubates them I think and then they are at least through the withdrawal phase and is there any role for that kind of rapid treatment? Well, um, the latter part of the question, let me, if I can, almost set that aside. Uh, National Institute of Drug Abuse is looking at that uh, whole notion. Uh, that ought to be answered by scientific medical authorities. Uh, as yet, uh, we are not willing to buy into that. And uh, so let's, let's let them deliberately develop the evidence of whether that's an acceptable medical uh, technique or not. Uh, I personally have learned enough so that I'm holding it at bay. 
Uh, one of the problems with this is there are no easy solutions. There are no magical solutions. Detoxification is simple. Three of us can set up a detox facility in an hour, and I guarantee you we'll make it work. We'll have a part-time nurse come in, make sure we don't. The dangerous ones are alcoholics. The rest of them are reasonably easy to deal with. Uh, detoxification. So the challenge isn't the first uh, seven days. The challenge is the next seven years. Now let me turn to the physicians community, though, because I think a lot of good could come out of this. Uh, we're working with several groups, uh, one of them with Dr. Lewis, uh, who's trying to put together a physician's uh, sort of non-drug addiction specialist physicians to talk about training. Our doctors don't like drug addicts. Our nurses don't like drug addicts. They're working with people with cardiac disease and traffic accidents and pediatric problems. And they, there's a bit of them, they're, they're disciplined people. You couldn't have gotten through the schooling in, in medicine. And so you basically don't like this self-inflicted wound. And when you see it, you're fearful of the patient's reaction to even commenting on it. And so we need a training program. We need a group ethic that says, uh, I will talk to Barry and tell him we see evidence of drug abuse uh, in the in the uh, symptoms you're displaying and give me some information and not be fearful of my reaction and oh by the way doc you are among the most respected Americans in this country and if you talk about my alcohol problem if you comment on the fact that uh, there's indication that I have a drug problem the chance of me treating your viewpoint respectively are enormously high. And by the way, I'm scared, I'm sick, it's coming apart, I'm barely getting through life right now, and when you say something, and then if you know how to plug me into a community, it can help, it's the greatest gift you'll ever make. We have a failure of the American medical community to face up to this problem, in my view. Now, there's a tiny associated part of it that I, that's causing me, I think, a political problem. And here's the problem. And by the way, one thing I know about is pain management. I've spent more time in hospitals as a patient than a lot of the young physicians have studying in them. Uh, we don't do a very good job on pain management in the American medical community. And we're focused, you know, sort of a byproduct. It's background noise. The, phys the medical team's trying to get you through uh, your heart problem. And God, are they good at it. And yeah, you're in pain, but come on, pain doesn't kill you, remember. Uh, that's a problem. So the rest of us develop a, a tremendous fear, uh, not only of the indignity of medical treatment, but uh, of the fear of pain. And I think it's leading a lot, with a lot of these goofy things floating around the country today. You know, we, one of them scientifically that's goofy is, do we need heroin to treat uh, pain? And you know, the answer is, if you're at Johns Hopkins, probably not. But if, you know, this medical marijuana issue, and a lot of them are there because there's an anxiety in the part of a lot of us about uh, pain management. I think that's a secondary that physicians have to help with. Um, so we've gone to the AMA, and we're dealing, uh, some of the professional organizations are incredibly good about it. Pediatricians have signed up for this general approach uh, in a very fundamental way. And I think there's a lot of good to, to, good to come about, uh, out of it. Thank you for that question. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, my, my question is uh, really a comment, and uh, it's intertwined with uh, the situation with money laundering. And coming from uh, a country that has a terrible reputation with this activity, uh, I'm concerned that some of the effort in interdiction is not enough. Because uh, some of the efforts at what, sir? In terms of uh, control, interdiction, uh, it's not enough because we are in a situation where if you are a Nigerian or African successful professional, a business person, there's always the suspicion that he's probably into something else. And uh, for 10 years of international banking travel, I've experienced personally embarrassing searches and questioning, but you get used to it. Recently, I read about the uh, investigation of Citibank with respect to what is going on with uh, money laundering. To me, it's the same experience or activities that BCCI 
was, uh, was blamed on. When are you going to really attack this issue at the root? Getting a real big fish and setting a good example of them instead of people who claim the street corner as a piece of real estate. Well, you know, it's a, a very important question, and it's a, uh, it's a fair one. Uh, we just had three days with the senior leadership of Mexico, and uh, there, there's a, a lurking resentment, suspicion. Some of it's caused by this U.S. certification process, which unfortunately has uh, over time not helped in my view. Uh, it's led to an implication that somebody else's drug supply problem and our drug consumption problem that's really the two uh, pieces of the equation. In fact, the drug consumption problem in Rio, in Caracas, in Bogota, in Pakistan is worse than Baltimore's. That's assertion number one. Assertion number two is we're producing drugs ourselves. Uh, now, to be fair, let me, though, if I can, just tell you in sort of an analytical way about our country. The one thing we don't lack is a ferocious willingness to apply a blowtorch of law enforcement to drug criminal activity. I'm very proud of it. You know, Tom Constantine, Louis Free, Ray Kelly. Uh, last year, we locked up 1.5 million Americans. Last year, we convicted a little under 17,000 Americans in the federal, the federal criminal justice system for drug-related crime. We have 105,000 people in federal prisons. About 67,000 are there for drug-related crimes. Uh, we have gone after money laundering in this country and largely driven it out of the banking system, although the Citibank thing I think was shocking, uh, more to follow ongoing investigations. Uh, but by and large, uh, you shouldn't uh, assume that we're unwilling. You know, people ask me, where are the big U.S. drug cartels? Well, I'll tell you where they are. They're in jail. You know, and if you look at the federal system, uh, of the total number we've locked up now, about 48 percent are foreign. So if you look at the retail wholesale distribution of drugs in the United States, in an analytical way, it's Nigerian, it's Russian, it's Dominican, it's Colombian, it's Mexican, it's Chinese uh, mainland. It tends to not be U.S. If you look at the drug distribution ring inside a place like Baltimore, it tends to be U.S. General, we thank you very, very much. Um, one thing I didn't mention, uh, the general's father was also General McCaffrey and uh, was chief of staff for the 92nd Infantry Division, which was an all-black uh, outfit during World War II. He's now a member of the, uh, active with the NAACP, and it's, it's one of his many uh, social commitments, which I think characterizes uh, his career, his orientation, the job that he's doing presently for the United States government and for us. Uh, you've uh, informed us tremendously, and we appreciate your effort. Thanks so much.